Hello, BookTube. It's Wednesday, and that for a long time has been New Comic Book Day in America, where new floppy, you know, 30-page comic books are released on newsstands. It's the day that fans set aside. They have pull lists at their LCS, their local comic shop, and they go. They they go, they hang around, they read everything they're not going to buy, they buy the few things that they have on their pull list, uh, they see what's new in the collected editions or omnibuses or whatnot. Uh, I used to do that. For years and years and years, I did that. Whenever I was in the country, I did that. Uh, sometimes, very luckily, I would have an LCS that uh, that knew me and that I knew them. And I did have a pull list, and they would also look for scarce or you know we're not gonna we're not gonna stock it, but we'll order it for you type items. I don't have that relationship quite right now, but mainly because. Of COVID, <laughs> mainly because of, of COVID nineteen, I I stopped going to my LCS. I I uh, my LCS for a long time. Well, for years and years before that, it was a great place called Million Year Picnic across the river in Cambridge. Uh, for years and years and years, that was my LCS. That was my sort of treat to myself on New Comic Book Day is that I would cross the river into Cambridge. I'd go to all the used bookstores. I'd get myself some lunch. I'd go to to Million Year Picnic, maybe even catch a movie. That was at a time a long time ago when my dogs were old. So they were just going to sleep soundly and peacefully for the whole of the day. Whether I was there or not, they weren't going to notice that I was gone. They weren't going to want to go out hiking or anything like that. So I was free to do that and developed a routine where I did that. Uh, then Millionaire Picnic burned <laughs> to the ground and started had to start over again. But that's a story for another day. Uh, in recent years... My LCS, for a long time, was Comicopia, a great, dedicated comic shop just outside of Boston's Kenmore Square. Uh, so you're in Kenmore Square. I had uh, restaurants. I had the Barnes & Noble connected to the Boston University. I had the post office at Kenmore Square where, bar where I had uh, a post office box where I got all my book mail. It didn't come to the house. It came to that post office box. So I had to go regularly. And drain it off. Uh, and just outside of Kenmore Square was this little shop, Comicopia. If, if just about, you'd walk just about a minute outside of Kenmore Square in one direction, headed towards the city. Whereas in Kenmore Square, if you walk a minute in the other direction, headed away from the city, you get to Fenway Park. Uh, instead, I would go to Comicopia. I knew, I knew the owner. I knew a lot of the people who, who worked there. The kids who worked there were really good. And they would, you know... I had a pull list there from time to time. They would get stuff that I, I that I actually wanted, but then I I uh, shut up the the uh, post office box in Kenmore Square. I started getting books just delivered to the house. Don't know why I didn't do that ten years before, uh, and saved myself the schlepping in all weathers. Going out to 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 that box when it's you know sleeting outside, <laughs> it's not particularly pleasant. Or well, one time when there was thunder snow and thigh deep snow, <laughs> uh, instead I just got everything delivered here. Uh, and once that happened, that whole nexus just blew apart. I, the restaurants, no. The Barnes & Noble at, the, at BU, no. And the comic shop, no. They all became a digression. I don't, I don't detour like that. I like to group all of my stuff, all of my errands around a nexus of one kind or another. And eventually, a new nexus did develop. Uh, a little bit further into town from Kenmore Square, uh, and one of the places in that nexus was Newbury Comics on Newbury Street, the very first Newbury Comics, uh, the one that's on Newbury Street, uh, where I would go regularly and I would shop for comics. And then they closed and renovated. Uh, they didn't go out of business. The comics were moved into a dank, dark, dripping corner on the second floor uh, because they don't make their money. Uh, Newbury Comics, despite the name, does not make their money off comic books at all. Uh and I still went. I had other things in that area. There was an actual Barnes & Noble. My Barnes & Noble was in that area. There was a big supermarket in that area. A whole bunch of other things. That, so that suddenly became a nexus for errands. One thing I hate to do in errands is go, you've just got to go to one place, get there, do what you have to do, turn around and come all the way back. That might be fine if you have a car, but it's not so. I like to group everything together. But then COVID-19 hit. And for a long time, that Newbury Comics was closed, of course. Then they, like everybody else, started doing curbside pickup and things like that, uh, compromises like that. And not only that, but everything else, all the other errands in that little nexus also broke apart. All the places 
that I would go in one trip, closed, went out of business, started creating usurious uh, COVID rules or whatnot. Uh, and that was the, that was it for uh, my floppy issue, new comic book week buying. I was, that would have been a traumatic separation at any other time, except that for a couple of years before that, uh, Marvel and DC Comics, the major publishers of superhero comics, the, the publishers that I follow, that I've been reading forever, uh, started pretty much actively trying to divest themselves of readers like me. Uh, pretty much openly saying that. Creators, writers, editors, artists, pretty much saying that they, they really don't want cishet white men reading their comics. And for some unknown reason, I'll never understand it, their editorial bosses saw that stuff on public media, on social media, and did not instantly fire these people. Instead, it, it was the implication was pretty clear that it had corporate approval, or at least corporate indifference. And the comic book showed it. You started getting, you know, utterly ridiculous stuff. The, the comics, the superhero comics that I'd been reading for 50 years started turning into food-obsessed YA, full of Twitter sloganeering, of Twitter politics. Uh, no no interest at all. No one taking them seriously. The artwork went off a cliff. I imagine because the pay rates dropped, and, and so you couldn't get the first-rate talent, there would always be things to get, but never, never compelling in the way that once upon a time they were. Good Lord. Once upon a time, I was, I was getting the major issues that came out from Marvel and DC every week a stack of them and loving them most of the time loving them uh so when that rift came uh it was largely painless when COVID 19 struck and suddenly i wasn't getting comics every week at all it was largely painless uh but every once in a while interesting things would crop up and and COVID started restrictions started to ease a bit people started to be, to be able to go about with masks on uh, and that started to get me interested in it, but there was still, that nexus of, of uh, Aaron's was still broken apart. Uh, so I started taking advantage of Mark Richardson and his, and his Deb up in Vermont, those poor long-suffering souls. <laughs> I started asking, hey, if you're going to your LCS, they have a the Newbury Comics as well. Uh, if you're going to your LCS, any chance you could pick up this or that for me? <laughs> And that went on for a long time because <laughs> they give me a lot of crap, but they're 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 inexplicably fond of me. So that went on for a long time. Uh, but and it was going to go on this week. That was going to happen this week. I looked at there are all sorts of websites to tell you what's coming out, what comics are coming out on Wednesday. And I went to one of those sites and looked at the comics. Ordinarily, I see nothing, absolutely nothing that is of even the remotest interest to me. But this week there were three things that I definitely wanted. That I definitely wanted to read. And I actually put in a wheedling little cringing request to Mark and his dad asking, you know, if you go to your comic shop, could you pick these up? Then I thought, no, the comic shop is open. It's open for business. You don't even need to wear a mask. They appreciate it, but it's not Massachusetts ordinance anymore. I will, of course, but you don't. It's, it's open for business. There's nothing restricted about it. There's no limited occupancy. There's no nothing like that. And that is also true for all the other places that used to be in that nexus of errands. I could simply resurrect that nexus of errands. I could simply do that. So I thought, well, why don't you do that then? So I did. <laughs> I did. Today, I did. I resurrected that nexus of errands, and one of them was the local comic shop. And I got the three comics that I was interested in. I thought I'd do a video showing them to you is comic book wednesday anyway michael k vaughn and i are, are already talking about a comic today we're talking about hellboy uh but i thought i thought i would show you the uh the three issues that i got this week uh they're all bigger than normal they're all special event issues that's the only way that i would want them i haven't been following continuity on anything so i'd be i'd be ruinously out of the loop otherwise uh and yet uh, despite that fact, <laughs> I still felt like I was ruinously out of the loop on all three of these. Uh, the first one is this. It is Thor number 24, uh, but it's actually Thor 750. Thor was rebooted a while ago uh, as a, a fat alcoholic amputee. <laughs> I 
like I said, Marvel Comics made it very easy to stop reading Marvel Comics. <laughs> Thor was my favorite character. Suddenly, he was an unrecognizable heap, a broken man. And that was not good storytelling. That was blue-haired SJW creators saying, well, this guy's the ultimate cishet hero, so we really need to tear him apart. We really do. We need, we, need, we need to show not only that he's ashamed of himself, but that we, Marvel Comics, are ashamed of him. Uh, made it pretty easy to stop reading the character. But the, the 750th issue, uh, the billing on it was that it was bringing back a whole bunch of story Thor creative teams for little bits and pieces. I got a variant cover really kind of like that cover uh and uh the story is the death of odin uh i guess he's odin has the king of the norse gods and thor's father has died in a previous issue and they're at his funeral they're reading from a book i think that weird thing is thor's new costume <laughs> i think i'm not 100 percent sure uh but th it had some neat visuals to start with look at that Black horse pulling the casket. You've got the thing from the Fantastic Four. You've got some of the Avengers. There's there's uh, Iron Man saluting. You've got the Silver Surfer. I think that's Ulick the Troll. Uh, but you also have the Watcher. The Celestials are watching the funeral of Odin. Uh, and uh, so I thought, you know, it, all's well that starts well. That That's pretty good. But no, <laughs> no. What we get for the first installment here is, I don't know who that is. I think it's Marsha from the Brady Bunch. But all this character does is whine and complain. Daddy didn't love me enough. He was, he was just complex. He wasn't always affirmative. He didn't always support what I do. Over and over again, from page after page after page. Then we get a, a little story that is done by Walt Simonson. Who did one of the greatest runs on Thor that that's ever happened, uh, and it, the run is about his one of his signature creations, Beta Ray Bill. Uh, fantastic, just delightful. Uh, all of the ads in this are in-house ads. Marvel has sort of scared away any outside advertisers. The it, the, the the company is run and heavily policed uh, by blue-haired Twitter ideologues. So. What company wants to do business with such people? What company hasn't been canceled by such people? So there's all sorts of in-house ads. Then we get uh, a little thing called The Seduction, uh, which is written and drawn by Dan Jurgens, uh, and features, I don't even know, I, this is from Thor, uh, Thor had a run in the 1990s that was drawn by John Amita Jr. And in this, in this run, Thor fights the Mangog, who is one of Thor's most formidable beings, and and dispatches him kind of easily. I mean, it's it's just that's one hand. It, it dispatches him kind of easily. Ordinarily, that would take six issues. That would be a major story, but it isn't. It's just sort of an offhanded exercise. And then we get something called Benedictions. This is J. Michael Straczynski is the writer, and it's Oliver Koipel who did the artwork. And though that were they were a team that did a great run on Thor. Uh, this is not great. <laughs> this is. It takes place during their run when Asgard is an island floating above uh, the Nebraska plains and humans have regular access to it and Thor is a weird uh, otherworldly figure. I don't know if you can make this out. Koipel always does this. That is what his Thor looks like. That is not a human brow. No human has a brow like that. That's a, a bear of some kind. Uh, but it's it's a, a signature thing that in this, in this uh, Benedictions short story. A human lawyer is brought to Asgard in order to write out Thor's will. Uh, and that's what the text is. Just endless talk. Just endlessly with Thor elaborating. Look at this. Look at that. Just endlessly elaborating on what he wants to be in this document. <laughs> uh, and then the lawyer goes home. Okay, that's the end of that. <laughs> and, then, and then there are quite a few uh, little bits and pieces uh subsequent in this issue that really don't impinge on the storyline instead they uh they're they're sort of meant to be teasers for launches of new titles uh but the story ends with uh the with odin's barge has been launched out and in norse fashion it now has to be set ablaze it's thor's duty as his son and heir to do that with a flaming arrow but he can't do it he falters look at that see he's had too many bourbons he can't do it so he hands the bow off to loki who does it? Uh, and you might think, well, okay, is that going to set up some sort of storyline involving Loki? Is there some significance to the fact that Thor couldn't do it, but Loki can? 
Uh, no, <laughs> no. When you're looking at Marvel Comics, you are looking, Marvel Comics as a company has been completely infested with far left, alt left, SJW ideologues. It's been completely infested with them. Every piece of content that Marvel does, with only a tiny few exceptions where the creator is just too powerful, every piece of entertainment, every piece of comics that Marvel produces is working on an agenda, a Twitter political agenda. Whether it's really overt or whether it's you just have to read between the lines, it's always there and it governs what's going on. The people who are who are governing this care nothing at all about continuity, nothing at all about comic books, nothing at all about Thor, except to destroy him, except to debase him. Uh, so you you know, in an issue like this where you've got all these guest stars in and they're all having different adventures and you're getting a chance to see some of your favorite creators for Thor uh, doing the thing again. The, in, a, in an issue like this, it's going to be easy to miss the ideologue stuff, the Twitter stuff, until you get to a moment like that. And there, the story does not give a reason. The story, there is no plausible reason in continuity why Thor fails in that moment. The reason he does is because in continuity, in canon, Loki is now bi. And that's everything. That's all. That, you might think that's, so what? But that's everything. That's all that matters. That, that shows that when, when the moment comes when one of these two half-brothers has to be worthy to do a final task, it can't be the cis-hate guy. It, it just can't be. Our laws say so. so. So the one intensely confusing moment in a book called Thor, when Thor can't do anything, he mopes and complains throughout the first part, and then he fails in his duty as a son in the second part. In a comic called Thor, where Thor only complains and fails, and finally hands over the responsibility to somebody else, you might read that and think, well, okay, some of this stuff is interesting, and I like seeing some of this artwork again, but what on earth is going on here? And that's the reason why. If you didn't know, that's the reason why. So... You know, I got this mainly for the same reason I imagine a lot of people did, because it was great to see these old creators back in harness, but uh, frustrating is putting it mildly. <laughs> and then the next big event, I mean, Thor 750, that's an event. Uh, the next big event was a first issue, also from Marvel Comics, Spider-Man number one, uh, starting a new volume for Spider-Man. Uh, this is written by Zeb Wells, but the key thing here, the key attraction, is that it's drawn by John Romita Jr. Uh, who's a great Spider-Man artist on his own. He's also the son of one of the greatest Spider-Man artists of all time, John Romita Sr. Uh, he has a particular style that... Uh, he has a particular style that uh, is very different from his father's. Uh, you, want, you want to feast your eyes on that panel right there. Uh, because that is literally the only time anywhere in this comic book where anything happens. No, no, there's an explosion. Sorry. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, it, there's a, a guy's house explodes. Uh, there you go. And that's a pretty good visual effect. Uh, John Romita Jr. is a fantastic artist. I, he's one of my favorite Marvel artists. He's also a fantastic guy. Uh, and it's, it would make it, uh, required reading for me to get this anyway. For John Romita Jr. to go back to Marvel Comics, he spent a long time at DC. For him to go back to Marvel Comics and draw Spider-Man with a new Spider-Man number one, of course, I was going to get this issue. Uh, but again, <laughs> again, first of all, when you're reading a Marvel comic, you are reading a piece of propaganda. You are reading a, a four-color installment of Twitter with sound effects. You're not actually reading a comic book. The people who create, slate, edit, write these comics do not care about these things at all. They've said this countless times on social media. They think comic books are ridiculous. They think comic books are for 40-year-old neck-bearded incels. They have nothing but contempt for the industry, nothing but contempt for the legacy that has been handed to them, nothing but contempt for the continuity, nothing at all. So when you're reading a comic like this, you just have to wait for all of the telltale signs that you are reading what those neck-bearded, uh, 40-something incels on YouTube refer to as an SJW comic. Uh, one of the characterizations that I mentioned, were mentioned already with Thor, is that if the main character is a cishet white man, he must be degraded. Not only externally, with everyone thinking nothing of him, thinking of him only as dirt, but also internally. He must think of himself as worthless. He must, he must think of himself as dirt. It, it's got to be total. It's got to be a total 
repudiation of the character with no heroic arc, no redemption, no nothing. That, that can, those things, the, the, the tinny approximation of things, are reserved for Marvel's 60 titles that don't star cishet white men. The, the fact that Marvel's uh, popular marquee characters here are from a, a class that all of its creators and editors feel free to be bigots about in public really chaps their hides. There's nothing they can do about it. There's nothing they can do about it. They can create an alternate Spider-Man who's black. They can create an alternate Thor who's a woman, but they can't change anything about these legacy characters, and you know they want to. Uh, that's one of the things you have to look for in an SJW comic, is is the cishet white hero uh, pathetic? Seen as pathetic by everyone else, and also seen as pathetic by themselves. Are they just pathetic? A washed up, broken thing, something you shouldn't admire. Well, that's true in Thor. It's definitely true in this issue. This issue takes place uh, in Media Race, so you, you're not really supposed to know what's going on here. I don't think you're supposed to know what's going on here. There's a major event that has happened six months earlier and is being alluded to in this issue. I guess there's an attempt there by, what's, what's his name again? Zeb Wells? to create dramatic tension by having you wonder what is this thing? What is this event that has everybody worried about Peter Parker? And that's incurred a huge debt for him, financial debt for him, uh, that has a, a, you know, a bill, excuse me, a bill collector sitting on his stoop, just waiting for him every day. Uh, we don't know what that is. We don't learn what that is in this issue. Uh, but the, the pathetic degrading of the hero is definitely there. There are a couple of other SJW hallmarks, uh, that you can look for. One, as I've already mentioned, is an almost surgical lack of action. There will be almost no action. Aside from the, th the two panels I showed you, there is no action in this issue. There's just people talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. Uh, that's another hallmark, uh, is, is there'll be no action. There'll be, nothing, there'll be nothing to satisfy the comic reader's gaze. There'll be nothing like that. If they've been coming to these things for 50 years and paying the bills and keeping the electricity on in the building where I work for 50 years, well, then I know the whole list of things they want in a comic, and God help me, I'm going to take them all away. You don't get any of those things, you pathetic losers. Uh, so you won't get any action. You won't have an, uh, an upright or an admirable hero if the hero is a cishet white male. Also, there will be, as I've mentioned in other contexts, a huge amount of unnecessary force swearing. Uh, that's all through this comic. It's not just the villains. It's Peter Parker. It's almost Aunt May. <laughs> it's all, all virtually every character. They're, they they put in the little line of uh, nonsense symbols. Uh, the writer does, puts in a little line of nonsense symbols. Let us know, we'll make sure that we know that our hero, Peter Parker, is just cursing a blue streak for no reason whatsoever in normal conversation with a villain, with a hero, with anybody. And the hero, the villains, too. We get a ton of time with the villains. Uh, New York's crime syndicate, various crime syndicate people. We have no idea what they're talking about. No idea why we should care about any of them or who they are. No idea why we're spending so much time with plotting and scheming villains in an issue that's supposed to be about Spider-Man. So much time with that. There's a tiny guest appearance by uh, Johnny Storm, the Human Torch who's uh, one of Spider-Man's closest friends. And he tries, it's a good scene, he tries to reach out to Peter Parker. Says, you know, something's wrong, and you're not yourself, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that is. Peter Parker pushes him away, so, uh, and that happens all throughout. He pushes his Aunt May away. He is uh, badly estranged from Mary Jane Parker, who seems to have uh, a boyfriend slash husband and kids. They might be his kids, and of course... I'll have to show you this because it's so incredibly predictable. This is what he looks like. Uh, this is what, what's his name? Uh, Paul looks like that. Uh, he's a hipster douchebag. He's vaguely ethnic. Uh, and the, he has kids uh, that call Mary Jane mommy. So I don't, one of them has red hair. Are they her children? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I, the, there is, once again, everything to do, everything that happens in an SJW comic book is private. You're not invited. If you're a longtime fan of these characters, you're not invited. You're a loser. If you're still reading comic books or an adult, you're a loser. Say the adults who are writing and editing these comics. If, if you're still reading this stuff and care about it, you're a loser. And you're a loser anyway, because if you care about these things, if you solve your problems by punching a villain, then you must be a crypto-fascist. 
and so and hence quote a garbage person unquote <laughs> so so this, the, the the pages radiate with contempt with corporate institutional contempt for the people who are keeping the lights on uh, and this also is a private thing this is there's a long story behind that one panel uh, that that uh, involves the arch nemesis of all of these creators Ethan Fenskyver who once upon a time in a video just off the top of his head, he's an excellent artist, and once off the top of his head, he drew a caricature of what his enemies look like. Just a, sort of an amalgam of what his what his SJW enemies look like. Uh, he's a crackpot uh, and a Trump supporter, so I, there's no love lost between the two of us, but he drew that uh, that caricature, and it was damning in a way that so, that is given to some really talented artists. They can really find the truth with their pen, especially when they're not overthinking it. Uh, that little profile that he did, that little doodle, is spot on. Absolutely perfect. And it might as well be Paul. They look exactly the same. So th there's some sort of echoing going on there, whether it was the writer wanting to send that up, or maybe the artist, John Amita Jr., who's a normal guy, uh, wanting to put that into the stew just for the fun of it. I, I have no idea. I don't know whether or not Ethan Van Skyver is still friends with John Amita, with John Amita Jr. Van Skyver has a tremendous, almost Olympic level ability to lose friends, so they might not be uh, friends. But the, the thing is, in this issue, we don't learn anything. <laughs> Peter Parker stops outside Mary Jane Watson's door. This is a signature. A John Amita Jr. signature is that things happen in the rain. He loves doing that. Uh, he's really good at it too, the special effects that he does of how rain is splattering on things. Uh, Peter Parker stops outside her door, but she tells him when he calls her, don't call me again. So something drastic has happened. Uh, and the one thing that I will give this issue, it has all of uh, the SJW hallmarks, the huge amount of unnecessary force swearing, no characters ever acting in character. That's another huge SJW thing. The characters can't act in character, not only because the writers don't know anything about the characters, never bothered even to research them. You're handed the X-Men, you can't even bother to look them up, to read any even single back issue, because that's what neckbearded fascists do. So you're not going to do that. Uh, not only that, but also because it's an, an, an act of willful vandalism. Uh, even if I know the characters' previous 50 years of characterization, I'm still going to have them be completely out of character to show that I don't approve. <laughs> but I don't approve of any of that. I'm just going to reinvent. This is my sandbox. I'm just going to reinvent these things. And because the corporate executives at Marvel and DC have bigger fish to fry, they have bigger worries on their plate, they just have turned away from, and it, it has been allowed to happen. Uh, so this has all of those hallmarks. People talk endlessly. This is endless conversation. No one's in character. Uh, there's no action. But I will say in, in, in praise of this issue that the gimmick, it's a well-known gimmick, the gimmick of teasing this thing that has happened that we don't know about that has changed everything uh, is really well done. That gimmick is really well done. What's his name again? Zeb Wells. Never heard of this guy before. Uh, I don't know if he's a guy. I don't know if he has he, him in his bio. But uh, I'm going to assume that Zeb is short for Zebulon. <laughs> it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, he does that really well. Uh, that aspect is done really well. I would continue to get this anyway. I'm going to buy John Amita Jr. drawing Spider-Man as long as John Amita Jr. is drawing Spider-Man. I imagine five, six issues pretty much the arc you would need to make one graphic novel. I doubt very much that he will stick around any longer than that. Could be. It could be that I'll be reading this on issue 30 with John Amita Jr. happily thwipping away. But uh, I'm, I was going, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get this anyway for the artwork. Uh, but I am, I admit, intrigued by the story. I kind of want to know what's going on. I want to know what happened that's that's caused all of these changes in Peter Parker's life. So that was Spider-Man number one. Uh, not a total disaster. Uh, and then we have the one DC comic that I got this week. Uh, this is uh, Justice League number 75, The Death of the Justice League. <laughs> With an acetate cover there. The Death of the Justice League. And this uh, starts off hugely uh, in the middle of things. I, we are given a, a, a fairly good amount of exposition. This character is an alternate Earth Superman who is president of his planet, President Superman. Um, we get a, a kind of pressy of some of what's going on. It obviously ties into a whole bunch of Justice League events that I don't know anything about. 
Uh, and when I saw that, those are in the first couple of pages of the issue. When I saw that, I thought, oh, well, this isn't going to work. Uh, but it does. The issue fairly does work. There is a villain, Pariah, a character from Crisis on Infinite Earths uh, from a long time ago. <laughs> and he assembles a dark army to fight this Justice League, the Justice League pulled from many different alternate Earths. Pariah, this guy who was not a villain in his previous installments, but now he is one, he assembles a dark army of extremely powerful figures uh, that we know, but that aren't acting like themselves. Ares, the god of war, dark side, uh, Mongol. But they, they don't seem like themselves, but they take on the Justice League. There's a wonderful panel here where, uh, where they charge into battle. Superman says, Justice League, you know what to do. And they just charge into battle, all of them, all of these alternate world Justice Leaguers, but also a lot of leaguers from our own continuity. Uh, and they're fighting, they're fighting, look at that panel, really well done page design. They're, they're fighting all of these, these bad guys uh, while Pariah is uh, scheming to fire some sort of thingamajig that will, that will bring about the end of some other thingamajig. And in the middle of battle, uh, I mean, the issue is, is it gives you what you're expecting. It gives you the apparent death of the Justice League. Uh, when, when Pariah is faced with the trinity of comic book superheroes. In a great panel right there. He, he is faced with the trinity of comic book superheroes. Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, the three greatest comic book heroes ever made. Uh, he's faced with them, and the death of the Justice League appears to happen. And is going to lead into an event called Dark Crisis, uh, which I guess I will read, although it's a little bit pointless, because DC might not be as infested with SJW far-left ideologues, uh, but it is just as inept as Marvel Comics. And the, pretty much the same week that they announced this issue, this big marquee death of the Justice League, uh, to, to commemorate the anniversary of the death of Superman, Pretty much the same week that they announced this, they also announced the event that is going to counteract it completely, where the gay Justice League saves the boring old cishet Justice League and brings them back to life. So we already know, fans that have been paying attention to industry news already know that this is nothing at all. There's no dramatic tension in this being real at all, this lasting in continuity for more than a nanosecond. But I still wanted to see how it was done, and it's done fairly well. I have to give credit to, uh, who wrote this thing? Uh, uh, hang on. Oh, yeah, you used to put the credits right at the beginning. You don't do that anymore. Uh, you probably put the credits at the end like you were in some sort of movie. Is that right? Are you going to do that? Are you going to put the credits at the end like you were writing a movie? Yes, you are. Joshua Williamson wrote this, uh, with artwork by Rafa Sandoval. That's quite good. Uh, that moment when the, the Holy Trinity is are the one, the, the Trinity of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman are the ones to face Pariah at the moment of crisis, uh, is really, really good, but this issue has a great moment. Uh, there are no great moments in Spider-Man number one. There are no great moments in Thor 750, but, and there aren't many great moments in the Death of the Justice League, but there is one, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and it's Green Arrow, of all people, Ollie Queen, uh, who... Uh, notices that Pariah needs this gimmick. He needs this doohickey uh, to work, and Green Arrow has a plan. He runs uh, and says to Black Canary, his his lover, his they're, they're a couple, he says, cover me, Canary. She's, she says to him, uh, Ollie, what are you doing? How she can say that while she's also unleashing her sonic scream, I don't know. Uh, but when he answers by saying, uh, what I always do, saving the damn day. <laughs> and he fires an arrow very cinematically. It goes right through all of the action to an absolute bullseye to blow up the machine, saving the damn day. So although this didn't have quite the punch that I wanted, it still had a great payoff moment. It had that, at least. So so this is the only issue of the Justice League that I bought in this whole 75 in quite some time. I haven't read this since issue 20 or 30, something like that, since before the pandemic. Uh and I don't know if Justice League is continuing after 75 or if they're, they're stopping the numbering and starting over again. But I, I might go over to Dark Crisis. I might go over and see uh, where this story goes to. It's, it was well enough done, so I'm curious to know where it goes next. Uh, which is not true with Spider-Man number one. I, 
I am kind of curious to know about that story, but the main reason I'll be getting Spider-Man number two is the artwork. Uh, whereas here, I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I'll be getting Justice League 76. Is, will there be any story? Will there be a Justice League 76? I don't know. I'll have to ask uh, at my local comic shop. There is one kid at my local comic shop who's tremendous at customer service. Plain and simple. Not comic book customer service, not Newberry Comics customer service, just plain and simple at customer service. That if you've got a real person, you know, a real customer, then you'll do what you can. You'll do whatever it takes to make them happy. I, I operated by the same philosophy when I was in customer service myself. And I like seeing it in other people. I like knowing it's not completely dead. <laughs> and maybe it's a Newberry Comics thing because Mark and his Deb say that their Newberry Comics is full of people that are like that. And I met some of them. They are really nice. So however that is he's still there he survived the pandemic and so did i so i will be checking out i'll be checking out with him where i should go next for this story uh, maybe i'll read up on it online although i've already checked that website for forthcoming comic books and there is not the slightest thing that interests me next week or the week after that not one thing not one thing it's two weeks before I need to go back to that comic shop. I may go next week anyway, just to see what I can see, just to poke around. Maybe there's something uh, just to, to cement this new habit, this new old habit. Uh, but there's nothing that nothing like these three things, where these three things I was waiting for. I was hoping that they would be good uh, and was largely disappointed. <laughs> so anyway, that's a nice long comic book video for you, a second comic book video, because Michael K. Vaughn and I, of course, do talk about comics on Wednesdays. Uh, but I, ha I got these things I had to show, too, so I'll, I'll stop talking now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.